Hello, everybody. Um, can you let me know if you if you can hear me or not? Uh, if you can hear me, say hello. I can hear you. Can uh, Can you guys hear me? Okay, you can hear me. Okay. All right, so um, we are just a couple of minutes delayed. Um, our presenter, Jennifer, she's going to be a little bit late. Um, she's having some audio issues. <laughs> so uh, I'm just gonna wait for a couple of minutes uh, before I start talking uh, because I see people are joining in a rapid rate. Uh, if you cannot hear us, uh, work on your, on your settings. Uh, let's give us a couple of minutes. Okay, guys, so... Uh, Today we're going to talk about how you are going to be able to afford college. <laughs> so clever ways to um, to be able to uh, do it with minimum money. So the one of the things that I wanted to talk about is we have a new initiative here at Scholarship Out. And uh, hello, it seems like someone someone is still having problems hearing me. Uh, okay, can someone send a message? You can hear me. Okay, write the number 10 in the chat if you can hear me. <laughs> All right. So um, the first thing that I wanted to talk about uh, today before Jennifer joins, <laughs> yeah, I got the 10s, uh, is a really awesome initiatives that we've been doing. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to show you guys uh, what we've been up to. Um, and basically what we've done is we made uh, a nonprofit organization uh, to go out and create more scholarships for you guys. Uh, we have already awarded 19 people uh, uh, scholarships and you can see the winners on our page. The page is futuremindsfund.org and most of you guys will probably end up uh, being eligible for one of these scholarships up here. Uh, so you go in here, let's say, for example, everyone is, is eligible for desk setup if you have enrolled in college uh, or high school. Uh, and <clears throat> so these are the different requirements. Uh, and you click the apply button here uh, and you can go in and you can uh, you can apply. Now, now, keep in mind, include a nice headshot if you want to be listed on our site, uh, because we've done something really, really unique. And that is that once you registered, and here are other other students that has won. Uh, <clears throat> so if I go to Simone, uh, she has a direct link. So when you find yourself on this site here, uh, there's going to be a direct link uh, to you. So someone can donate directly to you. So you can you know go to your family members and say, hey, <laughs> where's my Christmas present? 
uh, come and donate to me through the fund. Uh, and then they can uh, donate through here. And here you can see how much you have gotten so far. And also here's your story. So you can actually go out there uh, and fundraise for yourself. Uh, and, um, and so far we have fundraised $34,000 uh, and we are currently on fast track to, uh, uh, we launched it today. We just sent out a press release today and we are not giving up before we have around 1000 awards. And I want to repeat that. Our goal is to award 1000 of you students with a scholarship. That is our goal. Uh, we've been working on this behind the scene. Uh, it's kind of separate from Scholarship Owl, which is a for-profit company. But we make no money on this. It is just to help you guys. So uh, there you go. Uh, and I really, really hope that you guys go in and apply. And I also hope that you go in here, take your direct link, and, and give it on social media, give it to your friends, family, and ask them to support you in the fund. Uh, another thing we're going to do is that from other funds where you're getting uh, the funds directly going into your uh, college, here you actually are getting the money uh, in a debit card. Uh, the debit card had a few restrictions, so you can't use the money on alcohol or things like that. We definitely can use it for food, uh, for equipment, uh, for whatever you want to relieve your situation. Um, and does, this, uh, does this sound like a cool thing, guys? We've been working really hard on it. Uh, and they are our official sponsors, Ernest, Mosaic, Scholarship Out, Tuition Fit, Trade Coral, Scholarship Out. This is Honor Society. And NCSA has all been helping to uh, donate money to you. You can also see here how much they donated. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we are. Uh, we need you guys' help to kind of spread the message of Future Minds Fund so we can get more applicants and more donors. Because the more applicants we get, uh, the more donors we can attract. And um, it's going into the newspapers today, hopefully. So uh, uh, um, this is a, a gift to you guys, really. We, we did all this for you. Uh, and we wanted to do something special because of the COVID-19. And a big thank you to the whole Scholarship Owl team that was be working <laughs> their butt offs to, to create this in, in less than two months. Uh, we built the site from ground up with all the functionalities and everything. Uh, and hopefully uh, you guys will utilize it and, and help us to grow the fun. Um, that's basically what I have to say. <laughs> hey, Jennifer, you Hello. just came when I was finished uh, with the presentation of the Future Mind Fund. So this worked out just fine. It's awesome. Yes. And I see, just so you know, there's a lot of people in the chat asking questions about what you're talking about. So um, I don't know if you want to look at that now or if you want to wait until our Q&A to get to that point. But a lot of people are asking for the link to the site. Okay. So, okay. Uh, I, okay. I will put the link to the site and then uh, and then um, uh, and then what it's going to show up here uh, and then what you can do is you can just start and then we will also do question Q and A for the fun after the presentation because I think a lot of people come here to listen to your presentation, Jennifer. Okay, cool. All right, so um, I'm going to go ahead and put the slides up. Okay, you guys see the slides? Uh, Adrienne, I just wanna make sure you guys see the slides. We do. Okay, awesome. All right, so um, I'm gonna turn off my camera. Okay, so um, if you're in the process of applying to colleges or will be soon, I'm sure that one of the things that's foremost on your mind is the ever-growing cost of college. One of the most common questions I'm asked is, how am I ever going to be able to pay for college? If you've been wondering the same thing, you're in luck, because today I'm gonna to share the tips and strategies that I've found to be helpful for my own kids, as well as for the kids I've worked with. So let's take a look at what we're going to cover today. In today's webinar, we're gonna start with the basics, understanding the cost of attendance, determining your financial need, financial aid eligibility, how the FAFSA can help, federal and state grants, work study, loans, applying for scholarships, other ways you can reduce the cost of college. And then as uh, Adrian mentioned, we're also going to have a live Q&A after the presentation. So as we're going along here, just go ahead and input your questions in the chat. And then when we get to the q and I'll answer as many as I can. For those who watch through the entire webinar, we're gonna be offering a special thank you gift that we'll talk more about at the end of the webinar. All right, so let me get to the next slide here. So according to the College Board, the average cost of attending an in-state public university in the United States is about $25,000 a year. 
multiply that by four, and you'll see that the average cost for a bachelor's degree is about $100 if you attend a public and state university. The average cost of attending an out-of-state public university is about $42,000 per year, or multiplied by four, that's $168,000 for a four-year degree. The average cost of attending a private university in the United States is about $52,000 per year, multiplied by four, that means the average cost for a bachelor's degree at a private university can top $200,000. And of course, this is for U.S. citizens. This is not for international students. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. Um, of course, these are numbers that are about the cost of attendance and not the actual dollar amounts that students pay. Because of course, many students are awarded federal or state grant aid, and many students receive scholarships as well. So the actual out-of-pocket cost can be considerably less. Private colleges have large endowments, and they do sometimes offer substantial scholarships, perhaps eighteen to 25000 per year for students who have strong grades and a high SAT or ACT score. But even with financial aid and scholarships, many students do take out student loans, and their parents often have to take out loans as well, and all of those loans have to be paid back. But need-based grants and scholarships do not have to be paid back. They are gift money. So how does a person qualify for need-based grants and scholarships? Let's talk about that. To determine your financial need, the college's financial aid representative uses a simple equation. They subtract your expected family contribution, or EFC, from the total cost of attendance, or COA. The result is your financial need. COA minus EFC equals financial need. So if the total cost of attendance of your intended university is 35,000 per year, and if your expected family contribution is $10,000, then your financial need is $25,000. Will you get $25,000 in financial aid? Possibly, but not necessarily. Even though you might need $25,000 in financial aid and scholarships to be able to afford that university, it doesn't mean that you'll receive that much from the school. So let's say that you're offered $20,000 in financial aid and scholarships from the university. This is a process referred to as gapping. The university has left you with a gap of $5,000 that you'll need to make up somewhere, perhaps from your own savings or a part-time job or your parent savings, etc. But let's not forget that in this example, the EFC is $10,000. That means that the student or student's family will need to come up with $10,000 plus the $5,000 to be able to afford this university. And of course, the costs I'm giving here are annual, so the total out-of-pocket cost for this student could actually be about $60,000 for a four-year degree plus a bit more because the cost of college typically increases a little bit each year. Of course, you can take out student loans and your parents could take out loans. But as I pointed out with the previous slide, this is all money that you and they would need to pay back. And you would also have to pay interest on what you borrow. Wouldn't you and your family be better served if you could earn grants and scholarships to reduce your reliance on loans? You don't have to pay grants and scholarships back and the money you earn would go directly toward your out-of-pocket costs. To get started, you'll need to submit the FAFSA. I know there are international and undocumented students watching today who are wondering if they can qualify for federal financial aid and submit the FAFSA. For those students, students, I'm showing a graphic here to clarify who is eligible to apply. Note that there are other eligibility factors as well, but international students and undocumented students always wonder if they're eligible. So I wanted to be sure that those students who this applies to get the information they need right now. Both international and undocumented students do not qualify for federal financial aid and cannot take out a United States federal student loan. International students are also not eligible for state grants. However, many colleges do offer scholarships for both international students and undocumented or DACA students. And of course, the Scholarship Owl platform also offers scholarships that these students can apply for. I do want to note here, though, that it is very rare for an international student to have a full-ride scholarship that covers both tuition and living expenses. In addition, some states also offer grants to undocumented students. So if you're undocumented, you'll want to check with the state you live in to see if you might qualify for a state grant. I've also been asked if students who already have a bachelor's degree can qualify for federal financial aid for graduate school. If you're a U.S. citizen or eligible non-citizen, the answer is yes. You can and should submit the FAFSA if you would like to take out a federal student loan to help you pay for graduate school, or if you are pursuing a post-bachelor's degree teaching credential, you might also qualify for a grant specifically for teachers. 
Graduate students also can apply for scholarships from the universities that are applying to. And of course, can they, they can also apply for scholarships through our platform. You should also know that there are many PhD programs that are referred to as fully funded by the university, but this is typically not the case for master's degrees. So for those of you who really need assistance for college and you're thinking of getting a master's, you might instead consider taking the long route and getting a PhD because you typically can get fully funded that will cover not only your tuition, but even some or all of your living expenses if you go for a PhD. Okay. I've also been asked if students who already, oh, sorry, I already answered this question. Uh, one second here. I'm going to go to the next slide because I, I spoke already about this. Okay, so let's get back to your expected family contribution or EFC and how the FAFSA can help. How is the EFC determined in the first place? That's where the free application for federal student aid or FAFSA comes in. All students who meet the minimum eligibility criteria, criteria and who are planning to attend college should complete and submit the FAFSA, even if you don't think you'll receive grant aid. You may discover that you do qualify. The only way to know for sure is to submit the FAFSA. And if you're interested in taking out student loans or would like to be considered for work study opportunities, you'll still need to submit the FAFSA. Many scholarships also require that students submit the FAFSA as part of their application requirements. And universities often require that students submit the FAFSA as well. Without it, some universities might not consider you for merit aid and scholarships. Once you submit the FAFSA, you're going to receive a student aid report, or SAR, that provides you with your EFC number. If your EFC number is 5,000, then you can interpret that to mean that your expected family contribution is estimated to be $5,000. Note that this is an estimate and that only the financial aid officer at the college can determine what you might receive in your financial aid offer. The FAFSA filing period opens on February, I'm sorry, on October 1st every year. The closing date will vary depending on your state and it also often varies on the college. So you need to check the deadlines that have been set at each of the colleges you're applying to, as well as check your state deadline. Often the colleges are deadlines, college deadlines are earlier than the state deadline. As an example, in California, the deadline is March 2nd, but many California colleges require that they receive the FAFSA earlier than this because scholarship application deadlines are typically sooner than March 2nd. Okay, so assuming you are eligible to apply for federal financial aid, you're gonna to wanna to submit the FAFSA. Then you'll need to wait a while for each of the colleges to present you with their financial aid offer. Note that many colleges won't work on your financial aid file until after they've sent out an offer of admission, which can be frustrating. Private and out-of-state colleges do sometimes offer a scholarship at the time an admission offer is made, but even then they may not yet have determined whether or not you're going to receive any state or federal grant aid. Your financial aid offer might include a combination of federal and or state grants, student loans, work study, scholarships, etc. Or it might include only one or two of those. Many students are offered loans only. It all depends on your EFC as well as how much funding is available. So you're going to want to follow up to ensure you understand your full financial aid and scholarship package before you accept an offer of admission. So let's talk a bit more about what might be included in your final financial aid package. As I mentioned before, grants are gift money, meaning that if you're offered one or more grants through your financial aid offer, you will not need to pay back these funds. There are two federal education grants that students may be eligible for. Note that these are need-based grants, and whether or not you will be eligible will depend on your EFC. The most well-known federal grant is the Pell Grant. To qualify, you must be a U.S. citizen or eligible non-citizen, and you must be enrolled or planning to enroll in an eligible college degree or certificate program at a qualified college or qualified vocational or trade school. You must not have already earned a bachelor's degree or graduate degree. However, if you're pursuing a post-bachelor's degree teaching credential, as I mentioned before, you still might be eligible for a Pell Grant. The maximum amount Pell Grant recipients may receive is $6,345 for the 2020-21 school year. However, many students receive less than that amount. The amount you're awarded will depend on your EFC, the cost of attendance of the college you'll be attending, whether or not you'll be full-time or part-time. According to the 2021 Pell Grant chart, full-time students who have an EFC of under 5,712 may be eligible for a Pell Grant of some amount. For those who have an EFC that is higher than 5,712, according to the chart, 
you will not be eligible for a Pell Grant. Note that there are certain circumstances in which you may qualify for additional Pell Grant funds. For example, if your parent or guardian was a member of the U.S. Armed Forces and died as a result of military service in Iran or Afghanistan after 9-11, or if your parent or guardian was a public safety officer and died in the line of duty, you may be eligible for additional grant funds. Also, if you attend college year-round, you might also qualify for additional grant funds. A grant that is less known is called the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. Funds for this grant are reserved for students with exceptional financial need. So if you qualify for a Pell Grant, it's possible that you may also qualify for a Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. For those who don't qualify for a Pell, you also will not qualify for this grant. In addition to federal education grants, many states offer state education grants and or state scholarships as well. Each state is different, so you'll want to check to see what your state offers. As an example, in California, students may be eligible for a Cal Grant or a middle class scholarship. Both of these programs are also based on your financial need. However, the maximum EFC required is higher than for a Pell Grant. So there are many California students who receive a Cal Grant or middle class scholarship, even though their EFC is too high for a Pell Grant. And California also has programs for undocumented students. It's essential that you find out what your state offers in terms of grants and scholarships. Okay, and you can find that information on the web. All right, I'm gonna move forward here. If you're offered federal work study as part of your financial aid package, this means that you will be able to apply for work study jobs on your campus when you start school. The money you earn will be yours to help pay for your education, room, board, and other expenses. Essentially, a federal work-study job is just like any other job you might get, but there are some advantages. Most work-study jobs are on campus, so they're very convenient. Many colleges have jobs that are designated as work-study only, meaning that only the students who receive work-study can apply for those jobs. The biggest advantage is that any money you earn with a work-study job will not count as income on your FAFSA when you apply for financial aid the following year. So let's say you've earned $3,500 from your federal work-study job. When you submit your FAFSA for next year, that $3,500 won't be included as student income, meaning that it will not adversely impact your EFC. All students eligible for federal financial aid can qualify for federal student loans, and they don't need to pass a credit check or get a cosigner for these loans. Incoming college freshmen can take out fifty-five up to, to $5,500, and sophomores can take out up to $6,500. Juniors and seniors each can take out up to $7,500 for each of those years. Payback will begin six months after you graduate or exit your college program, and there are many options for repayment plans. Also, parents who pass a very simple credit check can take out a Parent PLUS loan each year to help pay for their child's education. If a parent is interested in applying for a Parent PLUS loan, the parent can contact the school's financial aid office to ask for the application form, which is a really quick one-page form. Note that parents are financially obligated to pack, pay back these loans and not the student, whereas a federal student loan is, obligation, is an obligation of the student and not the parent. Students who need additional loans can also apply for private loans. However, I personally would not recommend not going this route. If you and your family are unable to afford the school you want to attend based on the grants, scholarships, work study, and federal student loans that are available to you, I would suggest selecting a college that's more affordable to you. I do also want to mention that for parents who apply for a Parent PLUS loan, if you apply and if you do not get, if you are not offered the Parent PLUS loan, your student is then eligible for another up to $4,000 in federal student loans. So if for some reason, if the parent is denied a Parent PLUS loan, the student can take out up to $4,000 more. But for that to happen, the parent must actually be denied. Okay. So let's talk about scholarships. There are pr three primary sources of scholarships. Scholarships that are offered directly by each college or university. These are scholarships that you can apply to only if you are applying to attend that school. Some colleges will automatically consider you for scholarships once you submit your regular application to the school, while others have a separate scholarship application process. You'll need to research this for every single college you're applying to and find out what the scholarship application deadlines are. Don't assume that the university will notify you about scholarships. It's up to you to do the legwork and make sure you've applied on time. And be aware that the scholarship application deadline is typically prior to admission decisions being sent out. So don't be the student who gets accepted to her dream school and only then decides to apply for university scholarships. 
because by the time you're accepted, the scholarship deadline will have passed. The next great source of scholarships are the local ones in your own community. The easiest way to find out about them is to ask your high school career center or guidance counselor. Most high schools keep track of local scholarships, and in fact, in many cases, the high school actually has a single application that you can use to apply for all of the local scholarships listed with your high school. Local scholarships are awesome because far fewer students will apply for them since they're only offered to students in your community. And finally, there are many, many scholarships offered by third-party organizations. You can apply to as many of these kinds of scholarships as you like. If you're diligent and persistent, you might find that you're able to earn scholarships that really make a difference in your out-of-pocket costs. Most students search for third-party scholarships online using Google or by visiting any number of, of websites that discuss scholarships. The process is typically overwhelming and time-consuming, which explains why many students unfortunately often give up on searching for scholarships. It can be really frustrating. And of course, since seniors are super busy applying for colleges, as well as working hard on school and preparing for graduation, it can be difficult to summon up the energy to also search for scholarships, let alone apply for them. But if you use the Scholarship All platform, you'll find hundreds of third-party scholarships that you can apply to without having to search elsewhere. I'd like to take just a moment to talk about this as I get a lot of questions about how our platform works. If you're a Scholarship All member, all you need to do is log into the Scholarship All website and you'll see your scholarship matches on your dashboard. In addition, you won't have to fill out an application form each time you apply for a scholarship. Instead, your Scholarship All registration information will automatically fill in application forms for scholarships in our database. This again saves time and enables you to focus on the most critical aspect of applying for scholarships, creating and submitting whatever is required for, to accompany your application, which typically is an essay or a video. It's important to note that the scholarships in our platform have all been pre-screened by our staff, so you'll know that the scholarship is real and that the information is current. And I also want to mention that some of the scholarships in our platform are exclusive to us. You won't find them anywhere else because the scholarship providers are working with us directly. And the rest of the scholarships in our database are all scholarships that you could find yourself if you spent lots of time Googling and searching. What makes the difference is that we've already done the searching for you. We have pre-screened the scholarships to verify them, and our platform also streamlines the application process. For those of you who are not Scholarship Owl members, we do offer a free trial that you can access from our website, so you can try it out and see what you think. And then after that, there's just a really low monthly fee if you want to continue. But during your free trial, you can apply for as many scholarships as you like, which I highly encourage you all to do. Oops. So the most important thing to remember when applying for scholarships is that you should apply for all three types of scholarships. Scholarships offered by the colleges you're applying to, local scholarships in your own community, and third-party scholarships like the ones you can find in our platform or online. You want to create a plan for applying for scholarships that you won't be tempted to delay applying or worse, give up. Your plan needs to be manageable, attainable, and measurable. And you should write your plan down so that you'll stick with it. For example, you can decide that you're going to apply to X number of scholarships per week or per month. The takeaway here is that you can only earn scholarships if you actually apply for scholarships. And it's important to note that if you're selected for a scholarship, you didn't win the money. You earned it through your scholarship application efforts. Applying for scholarships does take time, persistence, and ingenuity. Students who apply to more scholarships significantly increase their chances of earning scholarships as compared to students who apply to only a few, and certainly as compared to students who don't apply for any. Also, once you get into the swing of applying for scholarships, there are things you can do to streamline the process. For example, let's say that you've applied for a scholarship that required you to submit a 500-word essay about your academic and career goals. When you're looking for other scholarships, you can check to see which ones require an essay with a similar topic, and then apply to each of them one by one, using your original essay as a starting point. Perhaps one of them wants a 750-word essay on that same topic. Take your original essay and add details and content to expand it to 750, Perhaps another scholarship wants a 250-word essay on the same topic. Now you can, again, take that 500-word version and edit and trim it down to get it to 250 words. If you follow this process, you'll be able to quickly and easily apply to a good handful of scholarships. I do think it's important that everyone also understand that in addition to applying for financial aid and scholarships, there are some other ways that you can reduce your out-of-pocket costs. So let's discuss some of those options right now. You can specifically seek out universities that offer lower cost tuition or even free tuition. Some examples, public in-state universities are typically going to charge a lower tuition rate for state residents. So when you apply to colleges, be sure that you apply to some public universities in your own state. 
just in case you're not able to obtain enough financial aid or scholarships for an out-of-state or private institution. There also are a good number of private colleges and universities that offer reduced tuition or even free tuition. Be sure to explore those colleges and consider applying to some of them as well. Here are some colleges that offer free tuition that you might want to consider. And I'm just going to list a few here. Alice Lloyd College in Kentucky. If you live in Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia, you may be eligible for free tuition at Alice Lloyd College. Barclay College in Kansas is a small Christian university. If you live on campus, you may qualify for free tuition. Berea College in Kentucky offers free tuition to all students. Students must work at least 10 hours per week on campus to qualify. College of the Ozarks in Missouri offers all students free tuition, but students need to work at least 15 hours per week on campus. If you are a music major, consider applying to the Curtis Institute of Music in Pennsylvania. Curtis offers free tuition to all students. However, students must be accepted via selective audition process. Warren Wilson College in North Carolina offers free tuition to in-state residents who qualify for need-based aid. Students work at least 10 hours per week on campus. Webb Institute in New York offers free tuition scholarships to all accepted students who are U.S. citizens or permanent residents. Webb is a small school offering only one course of study, a dual degree in naval architecture and marine engineering. Consider joining the Armed Forces. If you pledge to serve in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, or National Guard, you will be eligible for education benefits through the GI Bill. Some colleges will offer automatic merit scholarships based on your high school GPA or SAT or ACT score. Those that do this will actually tell you how much of a scholarship you're going to get right on their website, making it easy to see whether or not you would qualify for one of their automatic scholarships. You can also apply to public universities in nearby states that participate in a tuition reciprocity program. A tuition reciprocity program is one in which public universities offer a reduction in their out-of-state tuition costs to residents of nearby states. Not all universities participate, and there are sometimes parameters that need to be followed. For example, sometimes students must meet a minimum GPA or test score to be offered the tuition reduction, or in some cases, colleges might offer a tuition reduction only for certain majors. A tuition, uh, sorry, um, check out the map here to look for your state and see if your state is participating in one of these programs. So you can see that the vast majority of states do participate in tuition reciprocity. Um, I'm not sure, just to be clarified here, I just noticed that the California state, it, it's not highlighted here. It should be part of the WISH uh, regional compact, which is the dark blue color. So if you live in California, you're, you are part of a tuition reciprocity program. Other ways to reduce college costs. Of course, one of the easiest ways to reduce college costs is to live at home and commute to college. If you have one or more universities near your home, I would highly recommend you apply to them, even if they aren't your first choice schools. That way you'll have a backup option in the event that you're unable to get the financial aid and scholarships you're hoping for. You can also attend community college near your home and transfer to university as a junior. Many students do this to get their general education out of the way while saving money for when they transfer. And many states have recently implemented programs that enable state residents to attend their local community college for free for one or two years. If you aren't sure what the options are in your state, research it online to find out. And don't forget that community colleges also offer other scholarships you can apply for, making this schools an even more cost-effective option. One idea that students often don't think about is attending a community college that is either near your home or a distance away and living in an off-campus apartment. While this is more expensive than living at home, you would still save significantly on tuition. This is a great in-between option that enables you to have the full college experience of living away from home while also reducing your costs. You might also have a conversation with your high school guidance counselor to ask if he or she has any insight about programs that can reduce your out-of-pocket cost. And as I mentioned before, your counselor can be a great resource for finding out about local scholarships offered to students in your own community. Another note, your counselor may be able to help you to obtain fee waivers to save on the SAT or ACT, as well as help you obtain fee waivers for college applications. So in summary, be sure to understand the cost of attendance for each of the schools you're targeting. If you're eligible for federal financial aid, submit the FAFSA and understand the formula for determining your eligibility for need-based aid. COA minus EFC equals financial aid. Know the types of aid you might qualify for federal and state grants, scholarships, work study, and student loans. 
Be aware that colleges may gap you and not offer you enough need-based or merit aid to cover your financial need. If you aren't yet a Scholarship Owl member, activate your free trial and start applying for scholarships. Create a plan for applying to scholarships, something you can stick with that is manageable, attainable, and measurable. Understand other strategies for reducing out-of-pocket costs and use them as a backup in case you're unable to get the financial aid and scholarships you're hoping for. Apply to colleges that offer lower cost tuition or even free tuition. Apply to colleges within your state's tuition reciprocity program. Live at home and commute to college, whether that be a university near your hometown or your local community college. Or live away from home but attend a community college to save on tuition costs. Talk to your guidance counselor about scholarships, programs, and fee waivers that can help you conserve costs. In just a moment, I'm going to turn it over to Adrian, who will moderate our live Q&A. He will go through the questions in the chat and select as many as we have time for so I can answer them. And then after the Q&A, we're going to talk to you about my cost savings cheat sheet that we're providing as a thank you for watching this live webinar. You'll find it an ideal companion to our topic today. All right, Adrian. so let's get started with the live Q&A. Thank you, Jennifer. That was pretty amazing. Uh, am, I, am I frozen or? I see you and you're not frozen to me, um, but can you, okay, well, you can fine. get rid of my. That's fine. If I'm not Okay, no, if I'm not frozen to you, okay, so we need to stop the slide. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. If you could just take the slide uh, off. There we go. Okay, there, there. Oh, much better. <laughs> okay, guys, so I just uh, <laughs> just wanted to address a few of the, the questions that came in. Uh, um, and by the way, get your camera and so your mic ready. Go to the speak button and request to speak. We will prioritize people who ask questions before we prioritize the text questions. And that is because people like to see faces and can relate to that. Uh, however, I did see some common, a lot of questions there that I just wanted to address really, really fast. Uh, <clears throat> one of them is that there's going to be a replay being sent out. Uh, and as Jennifer said, there will be a cheat sheet. Um, and a lot of people had questions for our platform. I'm going to share my screen here. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the, you know, one of the things is that uh, people have had problems that, you know, there's a jungle out there when it comes to scholarships. And a lot of people don't win. Uh, and some of the scholarships out there are right up fake. Uh, and that's why we have new features on our platform um, that will give you a, a confidence score. Uh, so, um, so you can filter by confidence score. And we have a lot of criteria for confidence scores. Uh, so you can, you can filter out based on a high score, medium, low score. High score or verified uh, would typically be someone who had uh, given a scholarship before many times and, it, and always had paid on time. Uh, and those are those are verified, and then moreover, uh, we have uh, also flags. So if there's a scholar, um, a bad actor, uh, it can be reported by the students on the platform itself. We also started something new. We created some kind of algorithm uh, that is going to recommend uh, scholarships for you that you're more likely to win. Which, which I really like that feature. There was they spent a lot of time working on making that algorithm, and it looks at many many variables. So, uh, and someone asked the price, uh, the price is around, if you sign up for six months, it's like $10 a month. And with a time saving, I think it's well worth it. Oh yeah, uh, for sure. We cut, we cut, yeah, for the time saving, I just, yeah. So that's what I really recommend you guys to do. Regards to the fund that we created, and I have to stress, we make no money on this. This is a gift from Scholarship Owl to you guys. It's a nonprofit. Uh, it is uh, tax deductible, and we're not making any money on this. I want to be very clear on this. We're doing it for you guys. Uh, if you're international students, yes, you can apply. Uh, if you're a high school, uh, it's meant for uh, people who are enrolled in college. But between me and you, just apply. See what <laughs> happens if you win. <laughs> but officially, I'm not going to say that uh, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, um, it's a requirement. <clears throat> So, uh, um, let's take some questions here. Right. Uh, so I'm going to stop my screen. Uh, so let's see. So, uh, and one thing uh, on the on the, on the site, uh, when you land on futuremindfunds.org, you go in the right corner uh, and uh, you click students apply here. Uh, and that will take you to the application page. Awesome. And make sure you guys spend some time writing stories uh, because we do look at the stories. And also we know that the stories are also going to uh, uh, help you get funded. 
because uh, 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 people who donate will read your stories. So pay attention to your photo and also your story, and you're more likely to get funded. Okay, we have <laughs> we have Daniel here. Hi, Daniel. Hi. How can I help you? What question do you have? So, like, in college, do they, like, offer, like, ATMs and all that? Do you mean to take money out with a card? Yes, absolutely. Most college campuses do have ATMs on campus. Okay. And, and they have, like, student accounts, right? Student accounts? Um, well, you have to have a bank account first, right? So if you've got a bank account, then, you know, with whatever bank you normally bank at, you should be able to withdraw cash on your campus through an ATM, yes. Okay, thanks. All right, you're welcome. Okay, let's see if uh, anyone, uh, anyone else uh, wants, to, wants to ask questions. Uh, we're waiting for people to connect. In the meantime, uh, maybe we should take a question from the uh, the chat. Let's okay. see. <laughs> how many, uh, so Crystal were saying, um, how many scholarships is it recommended that I apply for or should I just apply for as many as I can? <laughs> well, that's a great question. Yes, you should apply for as many as you can. Um, just because the more you apply to, just, you know, by the odds, you're going to have a greater chance of getting scholarships. But that said, um, you should apply some kind of scholarship strategy. You shouldn't just willy-nilly apply to everything, right? So you want to look at what is involved in the scholarship. You want to look at the essay question, if you have to respond to an essay question. And you want to see if it's something that inspires you, that you want to write about, that you're going to actually take time and focus on. Because if, if, um, if you apply for a bunch of scholarships and you just you know say to yourself, I'm going to apply to as many as I can, no matter how well my essay is written, then you probably won't get that many scholarships, right? It's better to focus and do as many as you can apply to that you can take time with. I guess that is my answer. All right. That's a very good. That's a very good answer. And and by the way, we find the people who are most successful on our platform are the ones that apply for everything. And we have had people on our platform that has won um, because, in addition to awarding the uh, the scholarships, we are matching up to one thousand dollars. So if you win one thousand dollars scholarship somewhere, we will give you an additional thousand dollars. Yeah. And that is one of the biggest benefits to apply through our platform because you're not only winning one thousand, you're running two thousand dollars. And we had people on our platform that has gotten all together like $6,000 through our platform. Uh, and, and we find that the users that are, that are really active and apply a lot, uh, they're the one that wins. Yeah. Uh, and especially the essay ones. Uh, the essay ones does not have a lot of applicants. And that is another thing we started to do. On our platform, it will tell you how many applicants there are, uh, at least from our platform, to a particular scholarship. And it will give you a, a higher higher chance to win if you find the one with the lowest applicants. Yeah. So yeah, let's, uh, Rako, is that how you say it? Sorry, I butchered your name there. <laughs> Rocco. I, 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 Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. What's yes. the question? Um, my name's Raquel, by the way. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> um, so I was told that there are other grants besides federal and state that I can receive. And I was wondering if you guys know where to get those or if they're available on your website. Um, so some people may have said grant when they actually often mean scholarship. However, um, there are some colleges and universities that offer internal grants. And so it could be that that's what you're talking about. Um, in general, there's not a lot of grants from other sources that are not education related. I'm not saying there aren't any, but typically they're going to be federal grants, state grants, or grants directly from the college or university that you're attending. Okay. All right. Um, Melissa? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, great. You had mentioned the Parent Plus loan. Yes. And um, I was on a Facebook group about, you know, all of this same uh, subject, and that was the one thing most of the people told me to turn and run from. Why? <laughs> Why is that? I mean, I want to make sure I'm not doing the wrong thing. Yeah, no, I completely understand. So. Here's the thing, when you apply for a Parent PLUS loan as a parent to help your child go to college, which is a wonderful thing, I should say, um, if you wanna help your child pay for college, 
Um, but it's important to know that if you are applying for a Parent PLUS loan, that you as the parent are the one who is legally and financially obligated on that loan. So a federal student loan, the obligation is with your student. Now, what some parents do is they say to their child, well, I'm going to take out a Parent PLUS loan and help you, and when you graduate, you're going to pay the loan. And then the student says, oh, yeah, mom, dad, I'd love to pay the loan. It's no problem. I'm going to be earning buckets of money when I get my degree, and I'm going to pay down my loan uh, that I've got with you as well as the student loans I've taken out. And then they get their degree, and then when they look for their first job and they're trying to get an apartment, they're paying for food, they realize that it's really hard to cover it all, right? Well, what's the one obligation they've agreed to that they are the least likely to pay? that is going to be the parent plus loan or other private loan you have taken out on behalf of your child that they know they are not legally required to pay. Um, okay. it's, it's not personal. It's simply that they know that they're not going to get in trouble, you know, with the financial institution if they don't pay it. They know that they're that that's your obligation and not theirs. So um, it's okay. one of those things where I highly recommend that if you're going to take out a parent plus loan or a private loan on behalf of your child, that you know up front you are the one responsible and don't force that on your child to pay it back because in all likelihood you'll be disappointed. Um, and I say this in my years of experience of talking to students and parents. Okay, thank you so much, that makes sense. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, Natalie. Can you hear me? Yeah, I do. Hi Natalie, how can I help you? Hi, my student, um, we applied for the, we did our FASA. Okay. And um, she's getting a notation that she doesn't qualify for the, um, for the HOPE because of her GPA, but the qualifier is 3.0 and she has a 3.5. We're unable to get any, any um, feedback from the college. So I, I don't know what else we need to do. Okay. And you said, did you say the HOPE scholarship? Um, at, at the Pell Grant, I apologize. Okay, okay. Um, so the Pell Grant, it's not so much about GPA, it's actually about your EFC. Do you know what your EFC is? I do not. Okay, if your EFC, which you can find on the student aid report, so if you scroll back through the emails that you and your child received, um, you're gonna find the email that talks about what um, this, what's called the student aid report. And in that student aid report, you're going to see something that says EFC or expected family contribution. If that number is higher than 5,712, the reason why your child did not qualify for a Pell Grant is because the EFC number is too high. And what that means is it means that your family income is too high for your child to qualify for a Pell Grant. Um, and oh. I should mention that the majority of, of families do not qualify for a Pell Grant unless you are pretty low income. So, um, you know, there are a lot of people that think, well, I should qualify, but, you know, the intention of the Pell Grant is to help the most needy students. And so families that make, you know, middle income or above typically do not qualify. Well, we, they did it based off our, off our 2018 tax, tax return. Yes. Um, in October of 2019, I went on unpaid medical leave. So our salary is not at the same bracket okay. as it yes. was in 2018. Totally understand that. And I'm so glad you mentioned it because the financial aid officer at your child's college or the, child, the college where your child will attend is the person you need to contact. Um, if you've okay. had a significant change in your income, and many families have, especially because of COVID, so if any of you have had a significant change in your family income since you submitted the FAFSA, contact your school's financial aid officer and they will explain to you what forms to fill out because you may be able to qualify for aid that you previously were denied. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate your assistance. You're Stay welcome. safe. You too. It's amazing all the things you know, Jennifer. I'm so I'm so surprised. Like, how do you store this knowledge in your head? I've been doing this it's a long time. <laughs> You're, you're injured by your profession. <laughs> <laughs> Megan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Megan. How can I help you? Um, I was wondering if I don't have anyone to co-sign for student loans, am I still able to get them? Okay. If you are getting a federal student loan, either direct, uh, subsidized or unsubsidized, you do not need a co-signer and you do not need to pass a credit check. 
but if you need more than what is offered to you in your financial aid package, so let's say between you know your grant scholarships and loans, let's say you still need to come up with $10,000 and you're thinking of taking out a private loan, for that you would need a co-signer and you, they would also do a credit check. Um, if you don't have any credit yourself or if you've got poor credit, then they would check the credit of your co-signer and that way you'd be able to get a private loan. But I highly recommend everyone listen to me. Please do not take out private loans if you can at all help yourself. Um, it's gonna be a higher interest rate and they don't offer the same kinds of repayment terms as a federal student loan. So, you know, if you're in a situation where despite all of your best efforts, you, you simply do not have enough financial aid and scholarships to go to the college of your dreams, then go to another college. There's nothing wrong with changing your mind and choosing a college that's less expensive. And you'll really be glad you did later on because you don't want to graduate and owe $100,000. You know, if you take out the maximum in federal student loans every year, let's, so that'd be 5,500 for the first year. Sorry, 6,500 your second year, 7,500 your third year, and 7,500 your final year. That's, you know, that's a, still a decent amount of loans to have to pay off, but it is a decent amount. It's something that's manageable that you will be able to manage. But if you start taking out more than that, and especially if you plan to go to grad school or law school or medical school, try to keep your undergrad loans down without private loans. Thank you. You're welcome. That's uh, some very good advice there private loans. And, and another thing is that, um, you know, when you have a, a real student loan, uh, they're a lot more forgiving if something happens in the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, the private might not be as forgiving as the federals, <laughs> for example, during COVID-19. So, uh, yep. So, uh, 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 Jennifer, I'm, I'm done with names. I, I, I'm going to butcher that name too. But you know, I'm from Norway, so please, like, I'm, my accent is, is way off. But Micha, Mika, uh, uh, next one. <laughs> You need to unmute yourself because I, I actually manually unmuted everybody because it was uh, it was some noise in here. There you go. Okay, can you hear me now? I yes. can. How can I help you? Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm an international student and I have been accepted and now I'm a bit lost. So do you have any special advice in that case? Okay, so uh, what country are you from? Germany. Okay, and which uh, which college are you going to be attending? Uh, Stevens Institute of Technology. And where is that? What state? New Jersey. Okay, great. Well, um, so let me ask you this. Did they offer you any kind of scholarship? They did. I got a merit scholarship. Okay. Um, but it's, it's not really enough. Okay. Um, do you have a way to afford college with, you know, without receiving additional aid or are you kind of stuck? I'm kind of stuck. Okay. So, and this is unfortunate, right, for international students because there's not a whole lot of options. Um, one option is to go back to the university and explain to them that you really need additional assistance if you're gonna be able to attend. Sometimes uh, private schools will go ahead and up their financial aid offer to you. Um, they also may be able to connect you with options for loans. Um, but again, you can't qualify for United States federal loans. You'd have to get private loans. Um, yeah, it's, it's really tough. I, I've talked to a lot of international students and they really are hoping for a something like a full ride or close to a full ride. But unfortunately, most universities in the United States do not offer that to international students. Um, so and then the other thing is, of course, um, there may be some travel restrictions with COVID. So you want to keep an eye out on that, as I'm sure you have been. Um, I know New Jersey is one of the states now that um, is telling everyone they have to self-quarantine for two weeks when they arrive and things like that. So um, you'll want to be aware of what's going on there. But I don't have a lot of other options for you, unfortunately, other than trying to negotiate with the university and also looking for private loans. Okay, thank you. So All right, <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, Daniel uh, is the next one. So Daniel, uh, you might want to unmute yourself and another thing people were asking um, how they can um, get direct donations so wait a day until you show up on the website try to find yourself on the website uh, we still have some features that we need to work on so you get an email with your personal link but if you can find yourself on the website just search for the school that you put in and your picture will come up 
you click your picture and then you grab the URL on the top. Uh, and, and then you can give that URL. Uh, but we will be sending out an email next week with a unique link to your profile. And unfortunately, uh, we've been working as fast as we can, so that feature is not there yet. So, but it was a great question. So, uh, Daniel, I'll, uh, I'll let you ask questions. Yeah. So, so you can, so can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. So like how, so what are the ways that you can like pay like rent in college? Okay. Well, first of all, if you, when you look at the total cost of attendance for a college, you can actually see the total cost that includes an estimate for room and board, whether you're living on campus or off campus. So it's worthwhile to look at the total cost of attendance on each college's website so that you really have a better idea of what you'd be spending. And then when you apply for financial aid and scholarships, uh, you can actually use the money you receive to cover not only your tuition, but also your living expenses, your room, your board, your books, your transportation, anything at all that helps you with college, you can use that money for. Um, you can also work, get work study, as I mentioned in the presentation. If you qualify for work study, you can get a work study job. You can get a regular job, right? It doesn't have to be work study. You can apply for jobs on campus or off campus. And of course, you can also work during the summer. Um, you know, you want to apply all of your savings and have your friends and family that are going to give you money for graduation or birthday or holiday gifts. Ask them to give you money for college and do your best to save all that money. Um, so those are the things that people do besides obviously taking out loans to cover their cost. Um, you know, and you just have to have a plan. And I would say sit down with your family, figure out what your family can afford, how much they can help you. Um, I, I do want to take a moment here and talk about this because for many students that are approaching college, let's say they're juniors and seniors in high school, um, a lot of times parents have really kept them sheltered from the amount of money that is available for their child to go to college. It's a really uncomfortable topic. You know, I'm a parent, I had the same issue. I didn't want to reveal to my kids as they were growing up how much their money there was or there wasn't because, you know, we had different economic crashes, we had the depression, different things that happened. And so as a parent, you try your best to shield your child and you think, I want to make my child think that they don't have to worry, everything is fine. But then when it's time to start talking about college, if you hide from your child what their access is to funds to go to college, you're doing them and yourself a disservice. Students need to know as early as they, as they can while in high school what their own financial obligation is going to be. So for example, if you as a parent know that you can spend 5,000 a year on your child's education and your child is thinking you can spend 20,000 a year, that's a huge difference in perspective. And so I highly recommend that parents and talk to their students, let them know what is available, what they're doing to try to help pay for college. On the other hand, there are also parents who feel strongly that their child's education is their own responsibility, that once their child turns 18, they no longer are financially obligated. Unfortunately, the way the federal government looks at it is that parents should be helping their child pay for college until they turn 24, which is a huge number. Um, you know, most students graduate from college by the time they're 21, 22 years old. So the federal government has an assumption that families are, are going to help their kids pay for college. So the way that a parent looks at it, the way the student looks at it, and the way the federal government looks at it might be three completely different perspectives. So have those conversations early to help your child prepare and to plan for their own financial needs. Thank you. You're welcome. Very good. So, um, so Jennifer, we have uh, a two left. I'm not sure if Jessica is on two times, so if they're two different Jessicas, but okay. uh, your time is coming at an end. So I don't think um, I'm gonna prove uh, anyone else right now, or do you want to, let's ask, let's see what kind of questions they have first and how you feel. Yeah, I can go a little longer. I don't mind hanging out. So, um, you know, we can do this another 15 minutes or so if people want to stay on. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's uh, thank you. You're welcome. So Jessica, um, do you have a question? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Jessica. Hi. I've been homeschooled in my junior and senior grade years, and I have graduated, but it's but I've been out of school for twelve years now because I didn't have support okay. in college, and I decide now to go to college, and I've applied for and tried to apply for FAFSA. But they can't find the homeschool company. Okay. What do I do? 
that's hard, right? Um, most homeschool students are, should be able to get financial aid through the FAFSA. Um, so anyone who's watching who's been homeschooled, I don't want you to worry too much. But in your particular situation, it sounds like the homeschool you were attending is no longer in business. Um, you know, because normally when you when you homeschool your child, you work with a company. And um, even though you're homeschooling, the company, you know, has your academic records. Um, I would say this is just a guess here, but most states do keep records of, of schools, even if they're out of business. I know in California where I live, there there is a repository where schools who have closed are supposed to have kept your transcripts and things like that. So I would check your state's education department and see if they can find record of that homeschool that you attended. Um, that would be my best guess without looking into it further myself. Okay. And do you know how I can uh, if I can reapply for transcripts if say the transcripts got destroyed in a uh, how in a house fire? Yeah, if transcripts were destroyed or if they simply can't be found, um, you might be able to use a different process for admission. You would need to contact the admissions office of the college you're planning to attend to ask for assistance. And they can suggest options where they can help you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we have uh, another Jessica. Uh, Jessica, um... Hi. Hi. Um, my question, um, so when I was working out the financial logistics for my nursing future, um, my advisor had said that it was more financially uh, sound, I guess, to take the ADN and then transfer for the BSN. Uh -huh. But I heard, but when you were talking about it was easier to do or that it was, you know, to do the PhD rather than kind of the different steps. Right. Does that apply to an undergrad program as well? Or is that just for like so, the PhD? Yeah, no. So the fully funded program is specific to the PhD only. So not, they don't really offer that for bachelor's degrees. Um, okay. So for nursing, I do recommend that you start as a two-year RN. If, if finances are an issue, go to community college, get your two-year degree, get your RN, and then you can transfer and get your BSN. There are lots and lots of universities that have what they call BSN completion programs. So it's a great way to start your career in nursing a little sooner. And you can actually be working after you get your two-year RN while you're transferring, and that'll help pay for the rest of your education. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, let's see. Brenna is up next. Hi, Brenna. Hi. So, um, my family's expected contribution was over double of what we actually can contribute. And, and that's just based on the tuition room and board that the university estimated. Okay. And I will have an additional fifteen to seventeen thousand dollars a year in fees every single year. Yeah. What What would you recommend that I do? Yeah. Because so I didn't get any assistance. Okay. So did, when what you were offered for your financial aid, were you just offered student loans? Yes. Okay. That is a very common issue. Um, First of all, I should mention that when the federal government estimates your family contribution, it is often woefully higher than what the typical family can afford. Um, I know when my son went to college, our EFC that we got back was 29,000, meaning we should have been able to more than fully fund his college education, which cost even, it cost less than 29,000 a year. Um, and we were not in a position to do that. So, you know, we needed other options. Um, so you're not alone. But knowing you're not alone doesn't solve your problem, right? Um, so what I would say, first of all, is go back to the college, explain your situation, um, see if you can negotiate and get additional funding. If you can, that's great. But even if you can, they're not going to give you everything you're hoping for, right? Because you're, you're so different from what their actual cost of attendance is that you will have a significant amount of money that you'll have to make up. 
So then the question becomes, should you still go to that college or should you consider going somewhere else? Or do you want to take out extensive private loans, which as you know, I don't recommend. Um, but you know, you can do what you want to do. I think you have to really decide, is that dream school worth the nightmare of all the money you'd have to pay back? Or is it worth all the stress every semester, not knowing if you're going to be able to make ends meet to make the payments. So I think you really have to look at that carefully. Um, you know, it's unfortunate because the reality of most American families is that they are they do not have as much money available as the federal government thinks that they do to pay for college. That's just the reality of the situation. Do you, you have know, Jennifer? I think yeah, I, I think this is so unfair because yeah. like, the students that are on this call, they're the ones that are going to solve the next COVID nineteen. You know, they're going to be you know the next people are going to create the new society. I mean, yeah. they're going to solve all today's problems, and they're the ones that are being screwed. You know, yeah. it's like they're starting off with debt and, you know, it's just terrible design system. You know? it, it really is. It's antiquated. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I was a kid and when I went to college, when I was in high school and applied to college, um, if your parents didn't claim you on your taxes for two years, you were considered an independent student. Today, it's extremely difficult to be considered an independent student. You have to be either, you know, have a history of being a foster child or being homeless or being risk at risk of being homeless. Um, you have to be 024, you have to have a child. So, you know, the vast majority of Americans that are under age 24 are, you know, they don't have children typically. Most have not been homeless or at risk for being homeless. Most have not been foster kids or wards of a court. So the vast majority of students, it's assumed that their parents are gonna help them pay for college and not only help them, but help them significantly. And um, when you consider the Great Recession, the housing crisis, um, other recessions we've had, COVID, there's so many situations where families are not able to help. I will say that um, if, uh, if there's a student listening whose parent lost their job as a result of COVID or other things that happened this year since the FAFSA, like that previous caller, if your financial situation in your family has changed since you filed your FAFSA, let the college know where you plan to attend and have them help you because you may be able to get additional financial aid or scholarships to help you out. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, did you have more questions, Brenda, or uh, was? I do have another question. Okay. If I could. Sure. Um. Crap. <laughs> <laughs> um. What was? I'm sorry. I just forgot half of the question. <laughs> I will mute myself now. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> we'll move on to the next. It's Seth. Hello, Seth. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we'll we'll, uh, we'll mute you for a while, and we'll move over to Lynn. Uh, can you hear um, me? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay. Great. Um, I want to ask you about like how scholarship work. I'm kind of in a high school right now, so it just might be a little stupid, but yeah. Okay, what year, <laughs> what year in high school are you right now? Uh, I'm a junior, but I'm about to be a junior, but I'm graduating early. Okay, so are you gonna be applying to colleges starting this fall? No, I'm gonna start like, I'm an upcoming junior. Okay, but you said you're graduating early. So how early yes. are you going to graduate? So I'm going to uh, apply for a fall 2021st. Okay, okay. So you have a little time. Um, and I would highly recommend that you start applying for scholarships now. There are a mm -hmm. lot of scholarships that are available for juniors. You don't have to wait until your senior year. Um, you can use our platform. You can search online for scholarships. But to avoid the searching, I recommend the platform. It's a lot easier. Um, and then also, like I said earlier, you want to apply for local scholarships in your community. You would do that in your final year of high school. And then you also want to apply for scholarships from the colleges you'll be applying to. Mm -hmm. I want to ask, like, do they, because I, majority of my stuff are like art and like in the business field, even though I'm like applying for the psychology field, uh -huh. which like doesn't really make sense. So I don't know if like, if I'm gonna apply for it and do they like send me money and then I like enter when I apply for 
I mean, for, uh, sorry, um, for the university or how does it work? So if you are awarded scholarships, what happens is if it's a small scholarship, sometimes they'll send you a check directly. But mm -hmm. in most cases, they will send the check directly to the college you'll be attending or the college or the trade school. So let's say you're going to go to art school, for example. They right. often will send the check to the art school admissions office and then the art school will apply that money to your college costs. And if there's any money left over after your tuition is paid, then they would apply it to your housing costs or they would send you the balance. All right. That's it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, Dana, you are next. Hello. Hi. Hi, uh, I'm an adult student. I'm in my, I'm going to be in my 30s. And I was just wondering if you have any tips on finding scholarships because I know from my research, a lot of it's geared towards high school age students. Um, wondering if you had any tips so I'm not just looking everywhere. Yeah, um, it's true that usually when people think about scholarships for college, they're typically thinking about a younger student. But there are scholarships, plenty of them, that are for older students. Um, first of all, you can find them at most universities. And also, sometimes state grants have special programs for reentry students, what they're calling reentry. Um, and then also, if you search either in our database or online, you can often find scholarships that are geared specifically for older students. Um, on the Scholarship Isle platform, we do have a matching process. When you fill out your registration form, we match you to scholarships in our platform. And so if we have scholarships for students that are older, you'll come up as a match and you can apply to those scholarships. Great. Thank you. I appreciate your time. You're welcome. How are you feeling, Jennifer? I'm good. <laughs> so, how many do you want me to accept in? Because there are like 20 people waiting. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, well, maybe, maybe five more. How about that? Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Um, Aurora. Hi, Aurora. Hi, um, is my audio working? Yes. Okay, thank you so much for letting me join. Um, I was wondering, because I have high-functioning autism and because I graduated this year as a senior, I don't really know what to do in terms of um, applying scholarships and grants to um, the community college I'm going to go to. I'm wondering if there's any advice I could have. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, uh, congratulations on getting through high school and making the next step in your journey. I think that's awesome. Um, oh, most nice. community colleges do have programs specifically geared to students who have special needs, whether that be autism or other situations. So you should contact your community college and ask to talk to somebody in that office. Um, these days with COVID, it's not so easy to just call and get a hold of somebody. So you'll probably have to send an email and then wait for a response. Um, but they do have programs specifically for students just like you. Um, so they'll be able to help you with their application process. And also they can tell you about scholarships and grants that you would qualify for. And I'm sure you would qualify. So um, you should definitely pursue that. And they'll also help you with the FAFSA and any other um, assistance you may need uh, to get the financial aid that you need. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. I hope you guys are staying safe. <laughs> we are. I wear my mask, not on camera, but every time I leave my house, I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, bye. Okay. Uh, so next one, um, Cindy. Hi. 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 Hey, I have a question for you. I appreciate you guys taking time out to um, go over all of this with us. Sure. A lot of information. Um, so my daughter applied for Sally Mae, and okay. I co-signed with her, but we were turned down. Okay. Uh, said that I needed another co-signer. Um, with her and my husband is very hesitant about helping us out um, with her college. Um, I was a single mom with her and we, you know, I remarried um, and she was years old and I was a single mom. I didn't have anything set aside for her for her school sure. and for college. So I didn't have anything set aside while she was in high school 
to help her pay for college. Uh, my daughter wants to go out of state um, to SCAD, which is very expensive. Yes, it is. Um, she does have some scholarships that she, she did. We did get the Pell Grant for her. Um, it's just a little drop in the bucket. Um, she got a merit scholarship, another little bitty drop in the bucket, and um, a performance scholarship. So it helped a little bit. It made a very tiny dent yeah. um, in what she had received so far. Um, so when you talk about the federal student loan, mm -hmm. that's not Sally May. Is that something that's through FAFSA? Yes. So when you apply, when, when your child filled out their child, or uh, how old is your daughter? She's 18. She graduated, okay. she graduated this year. Okay. Yeah. And what, do you know her EFC? Um, I should. I have <laughs> the paperwork somewhere. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. But I know that if we did get a Pell Grant. We, we right. did qualify for a Pell okay. Grant. And it was like, so, um, yeah. So the like student that. loans, she should be able to get her own student loans that would be through FAFSA. And she can get up to $5,500 a year for her first year. Actually, if she's going to a private school, she may be able, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting things picked up. No, it's $5,500 for her freshman year. That's something she can get. She didn't need a co-signer, so it has nothing to do with you. But if you're applying for private loans through Sally May or through Discover or any other source, they do a credit check and the parent is then financially obligated. Um, yeah. Because even if you co-sign, if she defaults on the loan, then it's still your financial responsibility. Um, yeah. What I would say to her very kindly, if she were listening, and maybe what you need to say is, SCAD is a wonderful school, but there are plenty of wonderful schools in your own state. And I would recommend that she consider going to an in-state university where she could go for considerably less money. The Pell Grant will go a lot further. You might even be able to get a state grant in your state. Uh, what state do you live in? Um, we live in Alabama. Okay. So I'm not sure what Alabama has, but um, there may be a state grant there that she could qualify for that would bring her tuition costs down even more. Um, yeah. You know, there's no need to go to a private art school. I'm familiar with SCAD. It is a great school, um, but there's no need for it. Uh, that is, that is, that's a conundrum right now because she does want to get into performing arts and she doesn't want to take the, quote, academic classes because she struggles so much with yeah. with um especially with her math and sciences she struggles so much with that and she just doesn't want to like do the academic courses and we felt like scad was more career oriented and she didn't have those so she's going to have to take four years of math and science um like public in-state schools here in alabama would right uh, we're not really impressed with of course my phone system. dies <laughs> um what i would say is first of all she gets started at community college where it may be a little bit easier to take some of those general education classes but now that you're telling me she wants to pursue performing arts i'm even more interested in her going to a traditional university because um i'm a parent i'm i'm a career person i am a job placement person so i can tell you that a lot of people don't make it in the performing arts, and I'm sure you know that. So how awful would it be if she didn't make it in her chosen field, she didn't have the general education background, she didn't have a fallback, and she had thousands and thousands of dollars of private student loans to pay off. Um, I always recommend that students in performing arts instead go to a regular <laughs> university and not a private school. For just Je Jennifer, I, I, I wanna really underline that. I appreciate I your um, yeah. your comments on that. I do appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, we're struggling with it right now. We're struggling with her making that decision and wanting to go. Um, so we'll just, we'll have that with deeper conversations with her about it. So yeah. thank you, appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. Uh, so that, that is a really good advice I gave for performing art because I, I was educated a ballet dancer, believe it or not. And I'm not ballet dancer now. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I would say that uh, only, I would say around 5% of everyone that went in my class uh, are currently doing, doing dancing. The rest is, it, it's extremely hard. 
Uh, it is very, very tough. Yeah. Uh, so um, I, I really can underline what, what you just said there. <laughs> Get a broad education so you have more feet to stand on. So yeah. yeah. Uh, so the next one is Lyric. Uh, Lyric, uh, please unmute yourself because I, I muted you. I think because it was like <laughs> some noise. Some noise came through from somewhere. So there you go. My bad. I'm sorry. No worries. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, what I want to ask was that if you can't really get any scholarships at the moment and you don't really qualify for any grants, how do you like would like to say a good plan to pay for colleges? Yeah, um, the best plan I think is to start at a community college by far. Um, it's the least expensive option. If you have a good relationship with your parents and you can stay at home, then you don't have to pay for room and board. Or if they charge you rent, they'll probably charge you less than what you pay in an apartment. Um, tuition in many states is free or very affordable. Um, there, in the last few years, there's been sort of a revolution in community colleges where many states are now offering free co college um, for community college students. So you want to check and see what's available in your state. It's a great way to start. You can take your general education. You can take your prerequisites for your major. And then, you know, you've literally shaved off two expensive years of college and you can be working part time those two years and save all that money to help pay for college for when you transfer. And that also gives you two more years to apply for scholarships, two more years to do your research and figure out where the, the best place to go is for you. So it's a great place to start. Um, I really recommend it. The most important thing that I would say if you started a community college is you want to make sure you have a plan and that you stick with it. The one thing I will say is that sometimes community college students sort of drift off and they don't transfer. If your goal is to get a bachelor's degree, you need to have a plan. You need to work with an advisor at the college and make sure that they can help you finish your first two years taking the classes you need so that you're ready to transfer so you don't get stuck in a loop there. Um, that's the one thing I do find is that sometimes students, instead of taking two years at a community college, they'll take three or four because they simply don't know what classes to take. But if you work with an advisor, you can get out in two years and transfer. Thank you. I have You're another welcome. question. Uh huh. Sure. So I wanted to take the ACT, but I couldn't take it in time yep. to get it into the school. So if I take it again and I make the requirements, let's say my sophomore year of college can i am i still able to get a scholarship or that once you are transferring in you know in other words if you're not applying as a freshman anymore now you're an older student you do not need test scores anymore and so they don't even consider act or sat scores when you're transferring in but what they will look at is they'll look at your college gpa so you want to work really hard if you're going to be transferring and make sure you do well your first year or two of college so that when you transfer, you have a high GPA and then you can qualify for scholarships. I did not know that. Yeah, you don't need the SAT or ACT if you started a community college, which is kind of nice, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so um, uh, Crystal, I know you have had problem connecting uh, and uh, finally we got oh, you yeah. here. <laughs> um, it kept on kicking me out at the end, so I was kind of worried that I wasn't able to uh, ask my last two final questions. Okay. So my first was, what type of colleges should I apply for? Like, as in the range, or like, what different types should I consider so I get a better deal? I guess. Okay. So um, this is the process that I call building your college shortlist. So you want to apply to safety, match, and reach schools. Um, at a minimum, I recommend that everyone apply to safety schools and match schools. Reach schools are something you can do if you want to, but they're not required. Um, if you don't want to spend time or money applying to lots of colleges, then I recommend applying for at least two or three safety schools and at least three or four match schools. Um, if you want to go for some reach schools, or let's say you have your heart set on a very you know selective school or an Ivy school, you should apply for a minimum of three or four safeties four or five matches, and then at least three reaches. Um, you know, I, I tell everybody about this mix because so many students assume that they can get into their top choices, and sometimes they can't. I have actually worked with students who had over a 4.0, and they didn't get into any of their colleges that they applied to because they applied to only the most elite schools. So you definitely want to apply to some that, um, that you know for sure you can get into. 
And then beyond that, um, if you're looking for where you can get the most scholarship money, apply to colleges where you're in their top 25%. Um, so in other words, um, your GPA and your test scores, if you've got a test score, are within the top 25% of what they're looking for, you're going to be more likely to get merit aid if you go that route. All right. Um, and talking about te the test scores, um, I was wondering if I should aim to take the SAT because currently um, I'm a I'm a senior and we weren't able to take our SAT. Sure. So I think they might give us an opportunity to take it in the fall, but I don't think it'll be a requirement. And I know most colleges are having that optional as not required and stuff. Sure. So should I still try to take it or should I not? Okay. And if so, they do, am I required to put my scores on there if I'm not happy with them? Right. So first of all, yes, a lot of universities are going test optional for the um, upcoming seniors. Um, not all colleges are, though. So the first thing you want to do is find out which colleges you're applying to and if they are test optional. The other thing to find out is let's say they are test optional and you don't know whether or not you want to take the test. What you want to find out is do you still need to have an SAT or ACT score to get their merit scholarships? Um, many colleges are being a little bit disingenuous. They're saying it's test optional to get in, but what they're not telling everybody is that you still need your score to be able to qualify for a merit scholarship. So you want to check with each college you're applying to, and if it turns out that a score is going to make the difference for whether or not you can qualify for a scholarship, I say take the test. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That was pretty amazing, Jennifer. Like, uh, you really know your stuff. Well, I'm glad I was able to help out here. And I'm amazed that so many people stayed on through all this. I'm really. Yeah, yeah. me too. I, I, I'm blessed. But, uh, but uh, a lot of people want to know how they can get hold of you. And, and of course, uh, you know, Jennifer uh, re represents Scholarship All Here. And, and she is available for coaching, personal coaching. And you can write into us to get more detail about that if you want to have a, a session with Jennifer and to put a strategy for your education. Uh, you have helped many lives. Uh, we have seen a lot of testimonial coming through from having to be able to complete their education because of the advice they got from Jennifer. So, uh, uh, and, um, so this, is a, uh, this is a really good asset we have. <laughs> so write to support at scholarshipowl.com uh, if you want to um, have more time with Jennifer or ask her questions uh, yeah. and just say, this is a question for Jennifer. And also, if you do like this format uh, of, of a webinar, you know, send in to support at scholarshipowl.com and say, we want more webinars. Please do more. Uh, because that's going to, the, the company is then going to think like, oh, a lot of people want it. So we're going to run. Um, there was a, a few questions here in regards to the future mind funds that I want to show. Okay. And I want, yeah, I want everybody to come in here and apply for a scholarship because everyone is eligible for at least a desk setup scholarship, uh, and also study in isolation relief. As long as you enroll, you're you're at least eligible for those too. And if you didn't lose your job, you're eligible for that one too. So go in here and apply. <laughs> Uh, and and then and if you go here, they, this is where you donate. So when you show up on this page, you can find yourself. Uh, you can type your college name here, um, and then uh, the field of study, uh, the city, and you can find yourself in here. Uh, and then uh, and when you click yourself, uh, the the link on the top will change. So this is your unique link. So if you give this to people, uh, they will find you here, and they can put in their name and email, and they can actually donate directly to you. Uh, did you have, yeah. And then also, uh, you can donate directly to the fund without donating particularly. And these are real students that has applied. So I really recommend you guys, like I said, we are trying to reach the goal by awarding a thousand students with a scholarship. So this is the best chance you have to win from a lot of scholarships out there now. Definitely. So I really highly recommend you to, yeah, go, go and apply. We spent so much time to make this, to build this for you, to help you. So please, please, please go in and apply. Uh, and then also get your private link and get people to support you directly here. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, you have, uh, the, your uncle didn't give you a Christmas present. So send him a <laughs> link and said, this is your chance. Um, this is I your did. chance. I just want to mention somebody commented in the chat that they think this is for U.S. citizens only. And if I recall, you said that international students also can qualify. Am I correct? Yeah. Okay. As long as you have a student visa uh, uh, or permission to stay here or is enrolled in college, 
um, I, I, and so I think like just show your enrollment uh, in either high school or, or, or college and, and do it that way. Awesome. Uh, so not for, and if you look at the application itself, uh, someone pointed out it's for US citizen only. So if you look at the application itself, I'm gonna go in here, I click apply, and you can see here, uh, US citizen, legal permanent, or temporary resident. So you could just, just click what, what, um, what category you fall in under. Awesome. And also make sure, make sure you spend time, especially for guys, okay? <laughs> What is up with guys? You guys cannot write good stories, okay? When I read the guys' story, I deserve this scholarship because I'm poor. Okay, like try to explain, try to explain a little bit about what happened to your situation, okay? Because it is greatly going to increase. Because what we are doing is we're using these stories to go out and fundraise for you, okay? So the better stories uh, you have, the, the, the greater chance that you're going to be picked up for us to go out and, and actually find people who can fund you or donate to you directly. We are doing that. We have a whole team that goes out and promotes for you. So uh, please help us help you by writing a really good story. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just mention, since you said that, you know, for those of you who are who say, you know, gosh, I've applied for scholarships and I'm not getting any, think about the essays you're writing and see how much time and energy you're putting into them, right? Because the better your essay, the greater your chance of getting a scholarship, not just through Future Minds Fund, but other scholarships that are available. Um, if you become a Scholarship Owl VIP member, you have access to me reviewing an essay of you for you, one essay a month. And one of the things that I do is I give essay feedback and I help students strengthen their essays. So keep that in mind too. If that's a weakness of yours, um, becoming a Scholarship Owl VIP member can really make a difference for you. We have a, you know, we also have a blog, uh, scholarshipowl.com forward slash blog. We, we give a lot of content uh, and, and be subscribed to our newsletter and everything. We, we give out a lot of information, especially now during the COVID-19, uh, you know, and it, it might be just a little information that can, that can save your student situation, uh, you know, so, uh, so pay attention, uh, follow us, and we'll, we'll try to do it right for you. Definitely. Okay, we'll end it here, and uh, there will be a replay available tomorrow uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, so I will send you guys an email, and also we are uh, sending you out a review uh, email. So right after this, so please, please write us a good review. Yes, please. <laughs> it helps us to continue uh, giving you services. So uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.